the, the earth is going to pass away. And it's going to be burned up. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. As obvious as it is to say these things to, to these brethren, to, uh, to us that know these things, this is not an obvious thing to some people in the world today. There are a great uh, many people who are, uh, do a lot of things, as uh, Sister Nicole had said, to focused on making this world a better place to live in. You know, let's, let's do what we can to make this world a better place. And environmentally speaking, there's a, there's a lot of money spent. There's a lot of businesses that would go out of, they would lose a lot of money overnight if this truth was, was really came to, came to light to people, you know. I mean, think about how much money goes into make, you know, healing the earth. I mean, there's greenhouse gases and the ozone layer is being depleted and the, there's global warming. You know, this, this fear that has just been injected into the heart of it seems like everybody. And I, I think that I have to agree with part of that. I think that there is some global warming going on, but I think it's, I think it's more just a a preheating of the oven of judgment that's going on a little bit. Amen. So then in the culture around us, I, I think that there, there used to be a greater sense of this than there is today, that this, this world is going to pass away. Amen. But, uh, and this is actually leaked into the church some. Uh, not, not necessarily that the earth is not going to pass away, but the clarity of when this is going to happen. And that is that the earth is going to pass away when Jesus comes back. That these two things are connected and they can't be taken apart from each other. This is something that has to be clarified. In the, in the day when we have this premillennialist, amillennialist, you know, postmillennialist, all this garbage that's entered into the churches, it, it, it's cast a mist, it's cast a veil over the second coming of Christ to the point to where people can't have a confidence in it. They, they don't have a real expectation of it. They're not really living their lives looking forward to this. Uh, you can say whatever you want to about it, but they don't have a hope for the things to come the way that they need to to be able to live their lives confidently in Christ. This is something that you cannot, it's something that cannot be nebulous to you. It's something that has to be clear, it has to be clarified. This is something that is as rock solid as Christ's death. It has to be that solid to you. That just as God determined to send His Son the first time, God is determined to send His Son again with His angels in fiery indignation against those who did not believe. This is going to happen. Amen. And this isn't a nebulous truth. This has been spoken of time and time again in Scripture. We have clear word of this. And this is some I mean this is something that we can know about. This is something that we can have a clear view of. Uh, we shouldn't uh, get to the point to where we can say, well, you know, it's everyone has their different view of it and I can still shake your hand and call you a brother, you know, if you have a different view of this. This is this should not be an issue that we have this kind of division on. It's it's important that we know this. It's a life or death thing that we are able to look forward to and be able to at that time not have that catch us as a thief to where we can look forward to expectantly the second coming of Christ. So this, this whole chapter in, in the, this uh, epistle is like an exhortation to be alert, knowing that there, there are those who would actually deny the even reality of his coming. Uh, scoffers is what he calls them. Uh, those who are, are willingly ignorant of the fact that in, in times past, God did have a judgment on the whole earth. He's d destroyed the whole earth one time before. Not the, the, not the earth itself, but all life in the earth was destroyed once before. This has happened before. He uses the flood as a comparison, and he's, he's reckoning on the faithfulness of God, to, to his, God's unchanging and unyielding nature to do all that he's determined to do. His word is supreme, it's sure. Just as the destruction of the world was sure in Noah's day when God called Noah to do his work, 
and building the ark to the saving of his household, the destruction that awaits the world at the coming of our Lord is sure. He said that it's, it's kept in store by the same word. The same, the same God that did this in, the, in that time is going to do it again. And the seventh chapter of Genesis, um, speaking of the flood here, it says in the 600th day, year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the self same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them in the ark. The same day, that was determined before it, anything had ever even happened there. I'm going to go ahead and read this in 2 Peter. It's a few verses here, but I don't think that I could say it better than he did. He says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? We have people like this in our day it's to say the same thing. For, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, they are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of godly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Amen. See, time is not a factor with God. <laughs> the, the eventual passing of the... Uh, Natural order in our text, it's, it, this determination is just as if it was made yesterday. In, in, in eternity, time is not, an, this, this is not even an issue with God. The earth and its works will be burned up on that day. And this evening, I'm going to declare to you that it, it, this is not ambiguous. You can have this confidence this very night. Amen. So then. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now the apostle in addressing the eventual passing of the natural order, he starts by describing to us somewhat of the nature of this epochal event. And, and this is one of the primary reasons why this subject is of such importance because it will not come with a great deal of warning to those who aren't looking for it. It's, it's been suggested by a great many individuals that this means that the Lord will in fact come secretly to catch away the elect. And he'll come again at a separate time to take those other people that will believe. You're, you're familiar with the whole rapture theory. But uh, it's more widespread than I had imagined. It's actually hard pressed to find anybody who doesn't believe it this day. It's quite remarkable. But... This, this, this teaching, the Lord will come as a thief in a night, this is not particular to one reference. It's all over the place in the gospel and the epistles. And it means the same thing pretty much everywhere it's referenced, and that is his coming is going to be sudden and unexpected to those who aren't looking for it. This isn't talking, this isn't talking about a secret coming. And as we, as we look at this, you'll be able to see this. It's... It, those who have not prepared themselves for the coming of the Lord, His coming will be as a thief coming to them in that day. For they will without any expectation or preparation have taken from them everything that they hold dear. Suddenly and unexpectedly will be ripped from them. Amen. And that day they, they will see everything that they love, everything that they consider to be valuable. Everything that they have worked to obtain in this world will be torn from them in an instant. They, they won't expect it. It will come as a thief. And it will rob them of everything that they hold dear. And then this connection is made between the surprise nature of his coming and the negative effect upon those who will be surprised in multiple places here. You can, you can see that this is not talking about uh, a, a secret, it's not going to affect anybody. It says in, in Luke 12, And this know that if the goodman of the house had known one hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. Yeah. See, the, the, 
This is talking about a spoil here. This is talking about the people that are surprised are gonna, there's some judgment that's gonna happen here. And in the seventh, he, he also says this again in uh, Luke 17. He makes a comparison between the judgment of the flood and of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, he talks, he says, they ate and they drank and married wives and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah went into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. In, in Matthew 24, he says the same thing, but he says, and they took them all away. And likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat and they drank and they bought and they sold. They planted and they builded, but in the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And here, here it is. Even thus shall it be in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Amen. There's the connection between those two. That, that, this cannot be talking about a secret coming. This is not what it's talking about. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Uh, uh, this is not something that anyone's going to be able to hide from. There's no such thing as a secret appearance of the exalted Christ upon the earth. Uh, in Matthew 24 it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. I don't know how this could possibly happen without you knowing it. And then shall the, the, appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man. They shall see Him. The breaking forth of the exalted Christ in His full glory with His whole host of heavenly angels will just cause the earth itself to explode under the weight of the magnitude of His majesty. The, 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 the earth will just fall before him. I, if, if Sinai shook at just a, a small amount of the presence of God, can you imagine what's going to happen to the earth when the sky breaks forth and the exalted Christ shows up on earth itself? Nonsense, it's going to be secret. In 2 Thessalonians, he's talking about that man of sin that will be revealed. It says, Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Amen. Now, as we're speaking about this, I also wanted to take a minute to talk about, and it amazes me also how many people believe this, and this is another thing that is, is so widespread now that... Uh, the second coming has almost been exclusively represented as a time when Jesus will be coming back to Jerusalem to reign on an earthly throne. And this is, of course, based on a skewed view of Revelation 20. And um, as I was thinking about this, it amazes me how many people have taken uh, their view of something in Revelation and have... Uh, interpreted the whole entire rest of the Bible based on what they think Revelation means. They, they, they take what they think Revelation means and they put, use that as a template to, to skew the rest of the Bible. Instead of just taking the text as to what it says, you wouldn't come to this conclusion just by reading the Bible. You wouldn't come to this conclusion just by reading the Bible. Some man would have to tell you this. Some kind of false teaching would have to enter in to be able to convince you of these things. You wouldn't get this conclusion by reading our text tonight unless you think he was going to come and reign on a fiery throne of melting elements. There's going to be no Jerusalem there to reign at. There's going to be no earth. He's not coming to, to earth to reign. He's reigning in heaven. He's not coming to earth to become a king. He is a king. Well, we've read about this. We read about this in Daniel, didn't we? He, he came before the Ancient of Days, and he came near before him, and it was given him a kingdom and power and dominion. We read in the Psalms, and said, Who is this king of glory? The Lord's mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. Open wide ye everlasting doors and let the king of glory in. He is a king. He's already a king. Amen. Said he's, he's gone to prepare a place for us that where, where he is, there we might be also. 
So he's, he's coming to gather up, gather up his own that he might take us with him. I'm just afraid that that's not how the scripture represents it, how they're, they're talking about it. This, it says this in 2 Thessalonians as well. And to, to, to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to reign in Jerusalem. Does it, is that what it says? No. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Amen. It's, just good, it's just a good thing to think about. Now, this fire, this flame that we've been speaking about, this judgment, is something that's absolutely necessary. Uh, when Christ comes again to gather the elect unto himself and to judge those who didn't believe, the destruction of the earth is like the, the final and complete purge of the effect of sin upon the creation of God, which was. Uh, in Hebrews 12, he talks about this. He says, but now... Hath he promised, saying, Yet more will I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaking, as the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. The, the cursed earth will be folded up, so to speak, to make room for the new. So once the redeemed have been gathered unto Christ, there's not really going to be a purpose for which the earth must remain. The, the earth was really created essentially as a stage upon which the redemption of mankind would take place. Now, at the point in time God has determined for it to be the end, the desired effect for which the world was created, it's been reached, it's no longer needed. In this sense, the, the culminations of things, although it's going to be intense in nature, it's not really chaotic, it's actually orderly. And in Hebrews 2, we have this text here. We've, we've read many texts tonight that have been very graphic in their, their uh, expression of this. This text is talking about the exact same event, but it actually says it in a very, very precise, very uh, simple manner. But it's talking about the exact same thing. He says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens and the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And thou shalt wax old as doth the garments. And as a vesture thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed. It's, that's what's going to happen. He's just going to fold it up and make room for a new one. Amen. And the main reason for this divine determination is not only because it will lack utility, and there's no longer any purpose for it, but it, it was defiled. It was corrupted in the fall. Uh, the, the brute creation was directly affected by the curse on that day when Adam, by his one disobedience, made many sinners. There's not going to be any room in the heavenly Jerusalem for anything that defileth. There's no, nothing of the old world will be permitted to remain. It must be entirely destroyed. There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. We, we don't want to think about anything about the old world and that new world. So then, seeing that all these things must be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be? I believe that is the question tonight. If there really is nothing of this world allowed in the next, is it really, if it's really all going to be burned up, then what should our stance be in this present world? Well, I say that we ought to be light on our feet. We ought to be walking with our garments girded about, walking circumspectly, uh, being careful and alert, waiting for the day, awaiting for the time for him to come back. With a firm grip on the truth and with a, a light grip on anything in this world for necessary uses. Uh, there are a lot of things in this world that we have to be involved in just because we're in this world. But we have to be absolutely sure that we don't hold on to these things too tightly. We don't have a grip on them that, that we can't instantly let go of on that day. Amen. The 
question you have to ask yourself is, as it concerns what you're giving your time and affection to, is this. What, if I, what, is it, what I'm seeking going to pass through the passing of the natural order intact? I believe if this truth was wholly embraced by the tr professing church of our day as it ought to be, a, a large portion of our so-called Christian ministries, they just have to close up shop. Because uh, m most of what they're dealing with is just stuff that's here and now. Stuff that's, that's under the sun. All their coaching and people concerned about marriage and all this, all this other stuff, it's all things, everything that will pass away with the present earth. So be careful not to involve yourself with anything combustible. Just uh, strive to, to, to only buy up goods that are fireproof. Think about it that way. Now, this can, this, uh, there's two sides of the coin of this. Sometimes this can involve things that you do, and sometimes this can involve things that you don't do. Uh, a good example of this is in the fifth chapter of Galatians. He says, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So seek after the things that are of God. Stand fast in the liberty. Seek the things that are above. Set your affection on things above. And make sure that you don't, involve, don't get involved with anything that's going to create a bottleneck between you and the resources. On the positive side of things, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just and pure and lovely and of good report, if there be any virtue and praise, think on these things. Think on these things. And on the negative side, don't let any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Seek after the things that are good, put on the new man, and put off the old man with his deeds. So then, brethren, in closing, therefore be ye also ready. For in such hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over the household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Thank you, brother.